Recording in progress. Excellent. Thanks so much. So really glad to be with you here today. We are recording this webinar so that we can post it online and hope that we will just have plenty of time today to answer your questions. And by posting it, anybody who can't be here with us live today is able to get this information as well. We're at about 380 participants right now, so I don't think we need to consolidate. Um, uh, we should have plenty of room. This webinar will be uh, capped at 1,000, like we had mentioned in the communications we sent out about it. So I think we're in great shape to get started. Um, as always, uh, we are joined together today by our staff at DESE, the Shaw Foundation, and the COVID Command Center. Uh, today, the notable addition is my colleague Rob Curtin down the hall from me right now. I'm um, really glad that Rob's with us uh, because to, for today, uh, as we mentioned ahead of time, we'll be talking about reporting positive cases to DESE uh, to bring that back, but in a different way than last year. I'll turn it over to Rob in just a second to be able to talk that through. Uh, we also just want to give you an update on our testing program and uh, going back over kind of some new frequently asked questions, but mainly uh, sort of a review of going back over some of what we talked about last week, uh, looking at uh, Shaw, Family Foundation, uh, Shaw Family Foundation resources, and then as always, just wrapping up with next steps and your questions. So with that in mind, uh, just happy to jump in and Rob, turn it over to you. Feel free just to tell me when to advance the slides. Great, thank Great. you, Russell. Thank you, Russell. Uh, hearing a little hearing bit, a little of, bit of Russell, Russell maybe. Maybe. Yep. There we go. Hopefully that uh, works for everybody. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you all again. Um, I hope that the beginning of school is going smoothly. Um, and I am here today to talk to you um, and to sort of follow up on what the commissioner announced uh, last week, and you may have seen in media reports in the last couple of days that we will um, begin reporting um, positive cases uh, to the department again. Uh, Russell, if you can just go to the next slide. And what I'm going to do uh, is run through a set of slides with you. Uh, I'm gonna provide you with the information um, and then I'll do a demo of the tool that we have created for you um, so that you'll be able to uh, see it and see how it works um, and then, um, you know, happy to, at the end to answer any questions uh, that you may have. So uh, again, we, the, highlight, hi, the highlight here is, is that we will begin collecting positive case data beginning next Monday, September 13th. And the universe from which we will collect that from is all of our districts, and that includes our charter schools, um, uh, the education collaboratives and our approved special education schools. Um, all of those entities will be required to report any positive COVID-19 case to us. And we have simplified it for you this year. And to basically say that if you have any positive COVID-19 case for any student enrolled or staff employed by the district, that case must be reported to the, uh, to the department. At this time, we are not making um, any differentiation between if the student happens to be, ha when the student was in school, you know, if, there, if the student happened to be remote um, or, or anything along those lines, we are collecting positive cases on all enrolled students or staff employed, um, and those cases must be reported to DESE. Go ahead, Russell. So the big change for this year, um, as I mentioned, because I'm going to demo it for you, that is we will no longer, um, districts will no longer call DESE to report positive case results. And instead, all of the entities that I mentioned, including districts, uh, collaboratives, and approved special education schools will report cases through a, a security portal application that we have developed for you that I will be showing you. Please don't attempt to call in the cases. The call center is not being staffed to do this. Um, they will not, anybody that answers that phone won't necessarily be able to do it because they won't have access to the application for your district um, or entity like um, you do. The highlight here um, beyond the fact that we've developed a data entry application is that the amount of information that we're requiring has been decreased significantly, okay? Basically, we're going to be collecting three points of information on, on the cases that you're logging in, and that is the name of the school, the number of student cases, and the number of the staff cases. Okay, we are no longer collecting, we're no longer breaking out, um, obviously, in school or remote. We're no longer talking about whether it was an educator versus a support staff or anything along those lines. 
those are the three pieces of information that you're going to be providing to us. Um, okay, Russell. In order to get into the application that I'm going to demo for you in a couple minutes, um, that the access to that reporting application is provided through the COVID lead security role in directory administration. Okay. Everybody, all organizations that are required to report to us have a directory administrator in your district. Okay. That link down there that you see on the third bullet gives you a list of who that is in your district in case you don't know. Okay. Anybody that you would like to be able to have access to this application needs to be provided the COVID lead security role. Please do not call or email me or anybody else at DESE and ask us to assign access. We cannot do that for you. Okay, that is a district responsibility because the district needs to decide about who's going to have access to what they're seeing on these screens and what they're inputting on these screens. Okay, go ahead, Russell. Okay, this is uh, really important um, in terms of the cadence of reporting to us. We are going to continue our practice from last year to publicly report the case data on Thursday evenings. Okay. In addition, this year, along with the case data, we are also going to include the pooled testing results. If your district is or entity is produce, is participating in pooled testing, we are going to include those results um, into the weekly report at the district level. You might remember at the end of last year, we were including that information at the state level, the number of positive pools and percentages and whatnot. Well, this year we're going to, along with your positive case data, we're going to include that um, at the district level. Here's the key. The reporting week will run from Thursday to Wednesday, just as it did last year. Okay. So all of your cases need to be submitted into the security portal collection application by Wednesday at five o'clock of each week. Okay. And we are going to, on Wednesday night, do the work to pull all the cases that have been reported from th Thursday of, pre of the previous week to Wednesday at five o'clock of that week. And those will be what will be publicly reported for the weekly report that goes out on Thursday. Now, you'll see, when I show you the application, you'll see a little bit what this means, but the actual reporting in the application can be done as frequently as you choose. If, it's, if you wanna make it a daily routine where you can go in and report the positive cases for every single day, and you think it would be most beneficial to set up that routine in your district and have somebody do it every single day, uh, and that way you make sure it gets done, that's fine. If you wanna give it to us once a week and you wanna log in on Wednesday at, and do it every Wednesday with all of the cases that you have accumulated from Thursday to Wednesday of that of that week, that's fine too. We would encourage you to do it what best suits your entity in order to do it in, that sort of best meets your needs. Okay, so that's sort of the background information. I'm now going to show you the a demo of the application and it, um, it it's really simple. Um, let me show it to you here. Okay, Russell, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see that? Great. Okay, you'll notice that this is in a UAT environment. That means it's in our testing environment. So there's some um, language on here around UAT that you wouldn't see. Okay, this is our normal security portal. So you're gonna go in here and I have just a sort of generic username just to test it, but whoever in your district is doing this, they're gonna enter their um, username or password. Okay, and when they log in, um, there is, um, you're going to see a list of applications here that that person has access to. Right now, the only way you're seeing is this coronavirus case collection. This is the application that you're going to use. Okay, so the person will click on the coronavirus case collection system and come on now. <laughs> There we go, okay. And what you're gonna see here is, um, this is what it's going to look like, okay? And you'll notice that we have taken care of you entering your name and the date and time in which you're entering it. So this is how we're gonna know whether to include it in the weekly report. If it falls between Thursday and Wednesday, we're basically gonna capture all the things that come in, 
Okay, you don't have to enter your name. If I had entered this under my normal login, it would have populated as saying, it would have said Rob Curtin. Okay, so you don't have to enter any name. Okay, the, the first thing you're gonna do is select a district. I have three districts just populated in here as an example. And once you select a district, if I were to choose Worcester for an example, okay, it is then gonna ask you for the school and you'll see all the different school, schools here, okay? So if I was gonna be entering cases for Burncoat Street Public School, I would click on that, okay? And then very simply, all anybody needs to do is how many student cases are there at, for the Burn Street, Burncoat Street School? Let's say there was two student cases. Let's say there was one staff case, okay? And you would then um, click just add case and you'll see a success up here. Okay, and that tells you that you have um, that you're done. Okay, and if you need to do it for some an additional one, it'll keep refreshing so that you can keep adding in things for different schools. If I needed to choose another school, let's say it was Elm Park and I had one case there and no staff cases, I could then do it there and add it in for um, that school. Okay. Like I said, now I hope this makes a little more sense with the last slide I showed. If you wanted to do this every day, you could. If you wanted to have somebody keep track of this for each school in your district and then have somebody do it once on Wednesday afternoon, as an example, that's perfectly acceptable too, okay? So I'm gonna stop share there. I hope everything, um, as I've explained it, makes sense. I'm happy at, at some point um, when we're doing the questions to take any questions you may have about the, about the system. But again, the highlights are that reporting week and the fact that you are reporting all student and staff cases to us, um, regardless of what was, regardless of, um, you know, we're not talking about in-person remote or anything like that. Uh, Russell, with that, um, I will turn it back over to you. Great, thanks, Rob. And we will make sure that we collect the questions that are coming in. I'm getting a couple myself uh, about this and we'll maybe start the Q&A session about the reporting uh, questions and then go on to anything uh, that we're getting about the, the testing program as well. So thanks for the questions, keep them coming. Uh, if you could direct them more to Lauren than to me uh, because Lauren's able to aggregate the questions and ask them at the end. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, glad to follow up further about our COVID testing program, uh, as well as our uh, frequently asked questions, just to provide you with an update on where we are right now. Um, really to start with, I want to acknowledge that we're off, there's some challenges getting started right now. Um, and we know that uh, we're hearing from you, uh, we're gathering information and really working to overcome these challenges. Uh, we appreciate your diligence, your commitment, your patience, your communications. Um, and we're working on uh, communications as well. Uh, but uh, one of the key issues right now is staffing and it's, it's everywhere in the country. It's, and it's elsewhere here in Massachusetts between bus drivers and um, you know, certain related service providers and uh, certain teaching positions that are hard to fill. It's also uh, challenging to fill as many of the staffing uh, positions that we need to pull, pull off our testing initiatives across the state. And so CIC and the subcontractors that CIC has hired are working very diligently at this, and we have great confidence that this will come together. Um, we appreciate the demand that has we've heard from districts to get the staffing solutions in place. Um, we want this for you. We're working on it, um, and we anticipate it could be a couple of weeks until we get it fully up and running um, the way we want it to be, but we're really prioritizing. We're really working to make sure that you know we're looking at who's starting testing first versus who's putting off testing um, and that, that start date for their testing program to make sure that we're really supplying as many of the resources to places that are getting started um, very early in the school year um, as quickly as best we can. And um, again, the, the questions you've asked have really helped us make sure that we are um, thinking through that prior prioritization and thinking through uh, the mobilization of these resources. A potential solution in terms of finding more staffing um, could come from within your school community. Uh, for example, there could be staff members who work in an after school program who could have some hours available during the school day and might be well poised uh, to be part of um, the, the, um, you know, the, the staffing that's required to pull off our, our testing initiative. 
And um, in that case, uh, we would ask that if you know of people, they could certainly apply directly to the vendor who's working with you, the staffing partner who's working with your district. If you direct people to them, that could help them, you know, even more readily staff up, staff up, even more quickly staff up. And so we have seen this happening across the state. We're very encouraged by it. We think that, you know, kind of pulling all resources together, certainly, you know, CIC and the vendors, the partners are doing uh, incredible recruitment right now. We've in the period of a very short time, you know, short period of time, um, you know, we're talking about, you know, um, a high volume of staff that they have already hired. They are committed to hiring the rest. But if you know of people, um, they know your schools, they know where the, the rooms are in your schools, you know, particularly those people, if, you know, they're part of an after school program in your own buildings, um, they might be good people to draw on. Um, and there could be others as well who you could direct to the, uh, the staffing partner who you're working with. So um, I just want you to know from the beginning that we know there are challenges. Uh, we're all working around the clock to get them resolved. Um, and I am confident that this will come together. And I appreciate um, your not only your patience, but your questions and your feedback as we pull all these pieces together. Um, along these same lines, uh, just yesterday, CIC sent out a survey to the person who's identified as the COVID lead I'm sorry, the testing lead for each school. And so the, um, the survey is really, it's brief, it takes about three minutes, but we're just really trying to make sure that we are hearing from you about what are the, what's going well and what needs to be improved here in these early days, because we know these early days matter. And I appreciate CIC's interest in gathering this information and analyzing it, not only in the aggregate about how are we doing overall, but really at the school level, how do we problem solve each and every situation uh, that's coming up? And so, um, you know, you may you might be listening to this. You might not be a person who received the survey. Uh, we use the person who was identified through your application process for each school to get that survey to them. Uh, so someone uh, who is correctly identified at the school level has received it. We want to hear from you. We want to problem solve with you uh, just to make sure that we're delivering and not waiting for you to have to raise a question to us. Uh, we want to just universally check in, see where you're at and see what we can do to meet your needs. Um, and I'll be glad to see if there are further questions about staffing, because we know this is such a big issue uh, at the end as well. Um, but some other updates for you is that we have uh, updated several of our letters. Um, as you can see, they can all be found at our COVID testing website, our COVID testing webpage. And I just want to walk through with you what you'll see there. So just to start with, um, if you are using a rapid test, uh, by next now, when you're using by next now in this school, and you have um, a test result, and we need to communicate what the result is to families, we've developed a letter specific to that. Um, so that way you don't have to, again, find that language, develop that language on your own. Um, we've made sure that we're just providing you what we think is parent-friendly language around a rapid test result. Um, we also uh, have new letters around positive cases. So if you um, identify a positive case in your building, and Lauren, this is any positive case. This is through our testing initiative, and it's also through any other way that you'd find out a, about a positive test, correct? Correct. And this is a best practice that we're recommending for districts to notify families in their community when there's been a positive case. But it's obviously de-identified information and just notifies them that there's been a positive case and that their student or individual is not a close contact. And we appreciate the um, the ways in which we know there's already been some press around positive cases in schools, and we've seen the way in which you have provided de-identified information, and hopefully this letter will just help you with that as well. Um, as well as, um, you know, the close contact letter, uh, identifying if your child is a close contact, um, how to talk about that with families, um, and providing that information. And then um, what remains as a letter is just an explanation of the program itself. So what we're doing through the different uh, testing modalities that we have available, um, that letter is still available for you to use and we would encourage you to do so if you haven't already. So just wanna make sure that you um, take a minute to access our COVID-19 testing webpage. When you go there, you're gonna notice that we've updated, updated it and organized it a little differently just because you know we're, we're building more resources for you and we want to make sure you can find them as easily as possible. So I hope you're gonna like what you see when you go there. I hope it's gonna be uh, fairly intuitive for you to get what you need in most particularly these letters because we know how important communications with families um, is as you move forward. Um, we also had a lot of advocacy from districts around the way in which gender options were listed on the consent form. 
And so uh, based on the advocacy that we had from districts, we actually worked with DPH uh, to see if we could update um, the way in which gender is identified on the consent forms. And uh, we're very pleased to, to report today that there will be changes coming there, particularly around students who identify as non-binary, um, students uh, who uh, are transgender but identify as male or female, which is uh, very appropriate. We just want to make sure that um, you know our, the gender options are very much uh, inclusive of our student population. So those uh, changes have, are being made right now, and you won't need to go back out and get consent again um, whatsoever. I want to reassure you of that. But as um, new uh, families are signing on, we just hope that they see a more um, inclusive, inclusive options around gender identification. Just moving on, um, I want to go back over uh, what I talked about the last time in the way of the um, infection, the MGH infectious disease department contact tracing resource. Um, if you recall at our last meeting, we had Dr. Andrea Serenello with us and she shared with you the uh, a template for a way for you to organize information about contacts within your school. Um, who are the close contacts? Um, and how do you kind of keep track of them? Uh, because, you know, we think this would be an important resource, something for you to use to make that as, as efficient as possible. Um, so you can retrieve information as quickly as possible by using the spreadsheet. It's just a recommendation. Obviously, you don't have to use it. Um, but the districts that have used it have found it very useful, very powerful. And so uh, that spreadsheet is available on our um, uh, website, uh, the link that you see there again, you know, just going back to that web page is really going to get you everything that you need. Um, the uh, request from uh, Dr. Sierranello uh, and her colleague, Dr. Sandy Nelson, is that if you want to um, share your data with them uh, for the studies that they do around uh, transmissions in schools, uh, you can certainly, we would ask that you email them. Um, and I've included their email addresses on this slide so that if you want to be part of their study, and in fact, you know, the more that we can learn about COVID transmission in school, the better. Uh, so if you're using the template, if you're using the spreadsheet, um, please uh, consider um, sharing that information with Dr. Sierranella, Dr. Nelson. Uh, they will be very pleased to have you uh, participate in their study. We do anticipate um, some more information coming out uh, from their work, uh, likely early in winter. So um, stay tuned for more information about what we can learn uh, through the data that we can gather in our schools. You can also obviously use the spreadsheet and just keep the data to yourself. There's, it is not shared information. You own the data um, and you can decide if that de-identified data um, is something that you would be interested in sharing with the doctors at MGH for the purposes of their study. There are um, a few uh, uh, district folk who stepped forward. Um, who said, we really appreciated using uh, this spreadsheet. And so Marilyn Duggan and Noelle Freeman um, from Northboro, Southboro and Shrewsbury respectively um, are willing to tell you about their experience of using the spreadsheet. So that, that's new information for this meeting. If uh, you're kind of wondering about it and thinking, is this really worth my time? Um, what will I get from using the spreadsheet? Please consider reaching out to Marilyn and Noelle um, they're ready to, to help you with this. And uh, I just want to express my appreciation to both of them for helping us with, um, you know, just making sure that contact tracing is something that we can do as effectively and efficiently as possible. So um, consider using this as a resource. And I'm just going to uh, move on to our next topic, which is about ordering by next now tests. So let me just advance my slide. I got to move things around here real quick. There we go. Um, so Ordering by next now tests. Uh, we've had some questions about um, when we you receive your by next now test, how do you order them? Uh, let me just be clear about a few things. To start with, um, what, a, a practice that we changed last week is that any district or any school that now comes into our program that signs up for anything that would require by next now, um, really all of the testing modalities do require by next now. So if you sign on to our program, we are automatically going to sign you up to get by next now tests. Um, that'll be just sort of automatic out of the gate. Uh, because what we found is that um, in the very early days of implementation, uh, some dist districts didn't realize, some schools and districts didn't realize that they needed to take that extra step once they applied to also order the tests. And then when you need them, you need them. Uh, so we wanna get them to you as quickly as we can. So we wanna make that automatic. Uh, we are making that automatic at the very beginning of the process. So with that in mind, um, what I just want to reiterate for you today is just that um, 
you know, uh, we've had a lot of orders that have come in. Um, you've placed your orders. Um, they've come in centrally. And if you're unsure about the status of the of the order um, and whether or not you you have ordered the tests, actually, uh, contact your PC, uh, your your project coordinator, or email us at the COVID the K twelve COVID nineteen testing address there. And we're very confident that uh, by the end of this week or very early next week, uh, nearly all participating schools and districts will have uh, the tests that they've ordered. For example, we know that everyone who put in put in orders uh, by uh, the end of last week um, and over the weekend, those orders were shipped on Tuesday, for example. Uh, so they should be coming in very shortly to you or very soon to you. Um, and we just know that um, we're really doing everything we can to get them out to you as quickly as possible. Um, should you need more Binax Now tests, uh, we've included a link to the ordering form. And again, just keep in mind that the turnaround time is five to seven days. So when you're looking at your supply, it's just good to plan ahead to make sure that you'll have what you need on hand. Lauren, let me just pause there and see if there's anything else that we should add about ordering Binax Now tests. I think you hit it, Russell. Um, you, you know, you can always email into our um, COVID-19 testing inbox and we can check on the status of your order. But again, folks should be receiving their Binax Now test this week um, if they signed up with our program. Um, and so hopefully you'll see them flooding in now. Great, thanks so much. Another um, component to Binax Now is the expiration date. So uh, the tests do expire. And so we do have to pay attention to when they will expire. And um, tests that were shipped this summer and fall will not expire until December. And so as you're, as you're using them, as you're kind of burning through the, the kits that you have, um, we're just looking to keep up with you that, you know, we're giving you a supply that, you know, you should use up by that expiration date and then we'll have new ones come in uh, that will have a later expiration date. But there are um, a small number of tests that were shipped last spring that will in fact expire soon. So um, what I want you to lean in on is if you were a district that were, you know, if you were participating in our program last year and you have Binax now on hand from last school year and you ordered them last spring, um, I would ask you to take a look at that expiration date. And the way that you do that is uh, in the sub bullets here, uh, where you start by finding the lot number on the Binax Now box, determine um, if that lot number appears on the form that we've linked to um, on this page so that you can go there and just look to see if that lot number is expiring or not. Um, if, it, if, um, if it appears, you'll see that it has a new expiration date. And if it doesn't appear, the expiration date is that original date that appears on the box. So the going to that link, Checking that lot number on that form helps you know if the timeline was extended. And if it wasn't, then um, you know that it is expiring. Um, Lauren, could you just mention, um, you know, if you have an expiring kit, uh, what, are, what we want you to do? So at this time, we just want you to hold on to those expiring kits. Don't throw them away. Don't, um, um, don't send them back. We will coordinate with districts. Um, and we potentially expect that Abbott might um, ex extend those expiration dates again. So please just hold on to them and order new tests um, if you do in fact need them. And I just, um, I will put in the chat, but all this information that you're reading on this page will definitely be posted as we post our slides, but also lives on our COVID-19 testing page. So at any time you can come back to the COVID-19 testing page to the Buy Next Now section, and you can look um, and find the spreadsheet with the lot numbers and determine um, when your new expiration date is based on that, that lot number. Um, and so it always is on our um, COVID-19 testing page. Great, thanks very much, appreciate that. A related question about antigen tests is just if you can use a different rapid antigen test for test and stay. And our answer to this is no. Um, Binax Now are the only tests that we ask you to use, that we need you to use uh, for test and stay, that you may use for test and stay. Um, we have them available uh, through the state to all schools and districts free of charge. And just like I talked about before, you can request them through CIC Health. And um, we've, we've heard this come out and you know, we're working very closely to make sure that there's consistency in messaging, clarity in messaging. Um, but 
if you are hearing any reference to going out and purchasing um, over the counter tests on your own, we don't want you to do that. Um, if you're really in a pinch and you need those by next now tests right away, please let us know. CIC has been great at working with districts to figure out how can we mobilize, how can we get what you need um, right away. And our team um, here at DESC and the COVID Command Center team, we're all going to figure out, you know, what can we do if you're really in a bind? We hope that by and large you won't be because these large shipments have now gone out um, and you should have what you need soon. Um, but you really, we don't want you having to go out to buy them uh, when we do have them available for you. And we will work to problem solve, like I said, if you're really in a bind, if you're if there's uh, kind of an, an immediate need that you're facing as well. So those are um, a lot of the things that we needed to talk about related to our testing program. Um, I want to go over another point that we made in our last meeting, just because we're getting a lot of questions about it. And um, it relates to students, particularly uh, as an offshoot of our testing program, right, who might end up needing to quarantine. Um, either they didn't participate in test and stay, um, or there's some other reason why um, they might need to quarantine, as in uh, they were identified as being positive uh, for COVID-19. And so what's important about this is that uh, we did share this information in our FAQ on August 20th. I've included a link to that document um, right within the PowerPoint uh, that I know Lauren is putting in the chat for you to be able to download. Um, you can go to our FAQ section of our COVID-19 webpage uh, to get to what you need about to find this exact language. Um, but what's really important about this is that um, if students are home and uh, quarantining, for example, they're time that they're away from school would uh, would not count as structured learning time um, by and large. So most students, if they're quarantining um, right now would, uh, you know, you can send work home with the students, they can stay active in their learning, but their time would not count towards structured learning time, they would not count towards attendance um, unless you are able to allow the students, so that's that next bullet down, um, in that instance where a student is isolating or quarantining, this is the only reason why, um, the student would be able to uh, follow their schedule. We use the words join their schedule remotely. So predominantly that's going to mean live streaming. Now we know that younger students probably can't live stream all day. And so they could be, you know, uh, following the schedule could mean some combination of, you know, uh, live streaming and then doing some work independently, coming back to their teacher during the day. Um, but it has to legitimately allow, what you do has to legitimately allow the student to join their schedule remotely during the day um, and that you would be able to do so. And if this can happen, um, the student um, can be marked as present and particularly just in keeping with our overall guidance on attendance, uh, quarantining students who participate in at least half of the school day um, can be marked as present. So, um, you know, we appreciate the questions that we're getting about this. We really want you to, uh, to consider making this available because we know that there are a uh, variety of reasons why students might need to quarantine, might need to isolate this school year. And uh, we appreciate the kind of creativity and the problem solving that schools or districts are bringing to this uh, to keep students active in their learning. I do know that um, just for those of you who want to follow up more on students with medical needs who might need remote services. And what's important about those medical needs is that they have to be documented medical needs following the guidance that we have released in um, related to two of our regulations about home hospital tutoring or uh, reconvening the team for a student who might be out for more than 60 days. Uh, I'll be talking about that more with special ed directors tomorrow. It's been a topic that we've talked about throughout the summer. I'll be delving into it a little bit further tomorrow. And so uh, that topic is um, uh, worth exploring, but separately from this, because this is about students. Uh, who are um, isolating or quarantining and how they can follow a schedule for a very temporary period of time, right? This is a period of, you know, maybe five days total that they would be, you know, joining their schedule remotely. Um, hey, Rob, I just want to just check and see if there's anything else that you think we should add about this, about, um, you know, as this relates to structural learning time and as this relates to student attendance. Nope, I think you covered it well, Russell. All right, thanks so much. Let's talk about the definition of a close contact. Um, and, you know, I really appreciate your attention on this one uh, because this is becoming, um, you know, a big issue across the state. We can understand that, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing, um, you know, cases in schools, um, not surprising. Uh, we're seeing cases in communities 
there are going to be some cases in schools. Cases in schools does not mean transmission in schools. You're working hard to figure out you know, what the next steps are when you have that positive case within your school. And I really, I can see and very much appreciate all that's being done uh, to support our students and to, to identify those close contacts. But what I really want you to do is just step back and remind ourselves of, you know, what is a close contact? And, you know, I just like to make it like a mantra. Um, it's an individual who's been within six feet of someone who is uh, COVID positive while indoors for at least 15 minutes during a 24 hour period of time. And we just, you know, uh, emphasize that while indoors because of the numbers of questions that we're getting about where and when uh, close contacts are occurring. And so that indoor piece is really important. And so, um, and we, you know, kind of just added that sub bullet about outside time does not count towards those minutes that, you know, might need to be calculated to figure out if someone is a, was a close contact or not. Um, but what we ask that you do is, you know, to be deliberate about thinking about who's a close contact so that we're not identifying the entire classroom as being a considered close contact of an infectious individual. So, um, you know, being able to identify and more narrowly identify who a close contact is um, as a limited number of individuals, staff or students, as opposed to an entire classroom is gonna help on a few levels. One is that, you know, we really wanna keep kids in school. We wanna keep kids learning. Schools are managed environments. We don't see a tremendous amount of transmission in our schools. And so, you know, we wanna make sure that we're careful about who we're identifying because having them quarantine um, and stay home means that we're, you know, inhibiting their learning opportunities. And so we want them in schools. And so we wanna be careful about no, not over identifying. Um, and it also is, you know, putting more pressure on the kind of uh, resources and the, the staffing that it takes to pull this off. And so, um, you know, that tangible impact on both our support time and our test supply um, will be, you know, important to watch and important to like really be as, again, as efficient as we can about the use of finite resources uh, to make sure that we can pull this off well. And so uh, I would ask that you, you know, really consider ways in which you can identify who close contacts are and finding that balance between, you know, making sure that we um, provide that uh, very enriching uh, learning experience for students while at the same time, you know, just being able to, to um, uh, know, understand uh, who those close contacts are. And as always, we'll be glad to take your questions about this because we know this is a really um, important topic to, uh, to lean in on. Let's talk a little bit more about test and stay. Uh, the, um, we've had many, many questions that have come in about um, who can participate in test and stay. And what's, I think, just, again, very, very important to, to remember and to know about who can participate in, pet, in test and stay is that it has to be, um, individuals can participate when they're identified as close contacts, um, if they were in the school, they are school-based close contacts. Uh, and let's talk a little bit about why. So again, we have data that tells us that schools are not places where we have high levels of transmissions. Where are places that have high level of transmissions? Well, the home is one of the highest, right? And so that's, that student who came into, con who was identified as a close contact because of an exposure at home is actually a lot more likely, for example, to test positive for COVID than someone who was a close contact in school. So we start with the data. The data tell us that transmission in schools is low. So we need to think about a close contact in school differently than maybe out of school activities. Schools are also very managed environments. Um, we have adult supervision, we have hand washing, we stay home if we're sick. Um, you know, you can't stay home if you're sick when you're already home, right? So, uh, you know, the, the likelihood of coming, you know, how you come into contact with somebody who's infectious at home is just different than in the school. And so for that reason, uh, we really need to narrow this down to participating in test and stay. Um, what warrants the use of test and stay is to say that these are close contacts who are identified based on being in the school together. And uh, we've sort of been asked about like, well, where are the edges of that? Like what, what might constitute, what does is, what is school-based mean? And so, you know, if there are school-sponsored extracurricular activities and sports, after school programming that again is school sponsored so that we have those same parameters in place um, around being a managed environment um, that is closely monitored, um, then 
uh, we feel confidently that those individuals can participate in test and stay. I mean, we know that that's a challenge. Um, I think it's important to remember that we are going to uh, limit uh, quarantining, but we're not going to eliminate quarantining. There are going to be some um, uh, times when individuals are identified as close contacts and they legitimately need to quarantine. What we're trying to do is to say, we're going to limit this because you know, we really value learning first and foremost, and we, we know that we can do this safely uh, because of the unique circumstances of uh, and, and you know, um, the, the inequalities of close contacts in schools versus other environments. So uh, I hope that's helpful. I hope that might give you even some, you know, we know you're having to be on the front lines of this and explain this a lot in your communities. And so we hope that this differentiating between what does it mean to be a close contact in one environment or the other can help you as you describe this as well. Um, and, uh, you know, just a reminder about um, if you are identified as a close contact for outside of this, outside of school, you should follow what we call protocol B2, um, that, you know, the individual needing to um, uh, uh, either have the, the protocol of being tested and staying out um, uh, for, and be able, sorry, being able to return to school on day eight, or if they're not tested um, and remain negative, they can re or remain asymptomatic returning to school on day 11. Um, just want to pause again, Lauren, and see if there's anything that I missed there, anything to further clarify. Um, nothing that you missed here, Russell, but if you could just go back to that close contact slide, um, lots of questions about, um, you know, the definition of the close contact. And I just want to reiterate, I did put this in the chat, but our definition of a close contact has not changed from last year to this year. Um, folks need to look at our protocols for responding um, to COVID-19 scenarios to find out which of the close contacts would need to participate in any quarantine or testing. And so you could be identified as a close contact. However, because of either vaccination status or masks, or because you were you know, within three feet, you may not need to um, participate in our testing and quarantine. And so looking at that list of exemptions for um, our protocols is what you need to pay attention to. But this definition has not changed. Right, and this has been true since last spring. The definition remained the same. What, what began to change last spring is, what do you need to do about it? Um, right. And there are the exemptions, just like Warren said. So um, while the definition hasn't changed, the action that you take is dependent upon things like where you want a bus, are you vaccinated, just like Lauren said. So just want to further underscore that. Um, so thanks, Lauren. Appreciate that. Great. Let's talk about some resources from the Shaw Family Foundation. Uh, as always, appreciate their support. I mentioned this the last time, but just encouraging you to go to their website, covidedtesting.com, to look at where you can see um, really strong examples of consent and communications, uh, case studies, and getting started guides, which we hope will help you um, just navigate this and hopefully streamline it as best as you can. Um, and as always, we appreciate their willingness um, to just you know ex explain this, provide um, you know context. Uh, problem solve with you about using their tools um, and implement them well within your school or district. So let's begin to wrap up a little bit here, uh, looking at some next steps. Um, we've heard um, some uh, questions from you about where do I find things, right? Russell, you referenced these things in the webinars. Where do I actually find them? And so what we wanted to do today is to say, here are three places that, you know, maybe you consider bookmarking, or this is where you would go to get um, where we think the kind of uh, most uh, pertinent information to testing and our protocols and quarantining, all of these important topics, um, where can you, let's, let's talk about three places where you can go to find them. So first of all, we referenced repeatedly our COVID-19 testing webpage. So we've got a link there and, you know, Lauren included uh, some of the key things that you're going to find on, on that page. Our on the desktop uh, page is where you're going to find the messages that have gone out to schools and districts um, about um, COVID-19 action steps for you to take. Particularly, our protocols are listed there. And just like Lauren said, that careful examination of the, the protocols will really help you kind of operationalize what you need to do with different types of close contacts, for example. Um, so protocols, think about finding those on the desktop. And then our FAQs, um, just like today, we looked at the FAQ from August 20th, updated on August 25th. Um, that's another important place to look. So we just wanted to make sure that you had um, that kind of, what are the go-to places on our website 
uh, for you to get the information that you need. And we just listed them here. Uh, as always, uh, any, anyone who's listening and has not yet signed up for our program and is interested in doing so, uh, just filling out that authorized school application and statement of assurances will get you going. And then just a reminder about um, using you know, either our EMED at home tests or by next now, those can be requested through our order form uh, for by next now or the order form for EMED. And remember, EMED is that kind of emergent, uh, kind of rare or emergency situation where you need to be able to test students for uh, weekend events that might be occurring to know if they can continue their participation in school related events on non school days. The final thing that we just want to mention real quick is um, we definitely are, you know, hearing questions from you about who should we contact if I need help, who should I contact and um, we'd ask that you know trying to follow this hierarchy or or this these steps as best as you can uh, would be really helpful and so just starting with your program coordinator um, that's your best line of defense your first line of defense um, and if you don't hear back cic support would be the next place to go and then if um, you still have what you need um, let us know send us a note um, either our k-12 COVID testing site that's our team here at desi um, or the Shaw Foundation, um, and we included uh, their email there and uh, just appreciate the responsiveness uh, of all parties listed here uh, to get going. And, you know, just let us know as early as you can uh, when you're having issues. Uh, there is a lot of volume coming in right now. And so the sooner we hear from you, the sooner we can respond and help to get you what you need. Um, and, you know, again, hopefully the survey that we've sent out will also help to gather that information. So. Um, again, just uh, appreciate what you are sending us in the way of questions, and we're all working really diligently to get back to you as quickly as we can. So that's it for the presentation for today. Uh, Lauren, I'll turn it over to you again to, uh, to take a look and see what, uh, what questions we have coming in. Sure. Um, before I do that, though, for everybody, um, I'm going to put the slides right now into the chat so you have access to them, and all the links will be live in the um, in those slides and they'll also again be posted um, on our website. Um, so Rob, we're just gonna start with you um, with all of our reporting positive cases. So um, first question is, um, so we folks know that they need to start on September 13th, but do they need to be backtracking positive cases that have started from the beginning of their school year? Uh, no, we are going to begin collecting cases that districts are made aware of beginning on September 13th. Um, I got a good question that I should have mentioned as part of my presentation. The first week of reporting next Thursday, our plan right now is that um, we are going to do the first public report next Thursday, but it will only cover um, three days of reporting and then we'll sort of get into the regular reporting cycle. I've also had a question, a couple questions about I can't get into the application. Uh, the good news is you're not supposed to be able to get into the application, so nobody's doing anything wrong. Um, it's not available yet. We're not going to make it available until this weekend so that you can start entering cases on Monday because uh, we don't want you to give us your cases um, for right now, although we're speaking with many of you about your cases that are happening in school. Um, a question about uh, what should private schools do? Are they required to be reporting? Private schools are not required to report cases to the department. That's great. Um, someone asked, should they be reporting all cases? So um, cases that when they test in school and any cases that are tested outside of school that are reported to them. Yes, we are, you know, all of our students are, we are primarily all of our students are in person this year. We are not making, um, we are not distinguishing between um, where the positive test took place. We're asking you to report all cases related to your enrolled students and employed staff. Great. Um, what about for non-school-based staff? So anybody in central office um, or someone that's not directly affiliated to a school? Yeah, you'll notice that um, uh, when you do, when you click on um, in the school list, there is something that says like no child organization. Um, those are your places where you can put sort of your district employees if they're not, if they're not affiliated directly with the school. Okay. Um, if a school or district has zero cases for the week, do they need to enter a zero or should they just not report for that week? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I would say you can do either. Um, we will assume that if you haven't 
um, it, that if we don't have anything from you, we're going to assume that the answer is zero and we are going to report zero. Okay, so if you want to confirm that and tell us that there's zero, that works. But if you don't put anything, we're going to assume that you remembered to report, but you just didn't have anything to report, and we are going to put zero. Great. And then just to clarify, when you said private schools, we still want approved private special ed schools to report, just not yeah. parochial or independent private. That's correct. And let me just be clear. So the, the, the entities that are required to report to us are, are um, what we would refer to as our districts, which include charter schools and our regional vocational technical districts, um, our educational collaboratives and our approved special education schools. Great. Um, so the last question, Rob, I think on reporting is that many of the folks on this call are school nurses and people that don't typically have access to our security portal. So one more time, how would yeah. um, they get access to this? Yeah, Russell, could you share, um, please, um, the slide and, and, and go back to my thing? I think it's important for people. I want to actually show the link sure. to, some, to, yeah. to people. Um, so basically that we have a series of security roles um, that are associated with accessing various areas behind what we call our security portal. Um, and the, um, yeah, uh, yep, right there, Russell. Whoop. Back one. one more. There yeah, one. Go. Yeah, there we go. Um, and there are various roles that we, that, that people in the district assign to district employees to see various things behind the security portal. One of those roles is called the COVID lead, okay? And that will give you access um, to be able to see, get into this application to be able to report cases to us. The link in the third bullet there are the directory administrators in your districts. There's a long list of people who are have that title. Um, in, in, in the, in, you know, there's usually multiple people in each district. If you contact one of them, they can help you get access um, to the application if you don't already have it. And multiple people could be identified as a COVID lead, correct? That's correct. Yep. You could they can you can assign it to as many people as you'd like, um, and that will but and that will give um, as as many people as you assign it to access to the application. Great. Okay, Rob. I think that covers it um, for your portion, um, Russell. So. Good morning. I'm a, sorry. Just one one quick thing. Um, uh, I got a question about where the data on pool testing will come from on our routine COVID safety checks. Um, and so, uh, Rob, can you just reiterate where those data are coming from and any responsibility of districts? Yeah, I, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and I probably should have mentioned that. So there is no responsibility for district on the pool testing data. Um, we are receiving that data um, with, with our partners at EOHHS through the contractor, the testing contractor. Um, it's coming directly to us and we will uh, report it. There's no responsibility for the districts to provide us with anything. Great, and people are asking for the links um, to that directory um, administrator. So um, they I'll can be found. It. Yeah, you I'll want to put it in the chat, Rob? I'll put it in the chat, yep. Okay, they're also in our slides, which I'm putting in yep. the chat as well and will be posted to our website. Um, great, so um, some questions about our testing program. Um, so. People are wondering how do they get access to the software connecting with their PC. So Russell, if you could just show again that last slide of who to contact and in what order would be helpful. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry. I'll just keep my slides up now. Sorry. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. But just to reiterate, the first point of contact should really be a district's project coordinator from CIC. If that is not panning out as fast as you would like, you can contact the CIC support line. Um, and then next slide, Russell. Um, yep. And then um, if that is not working out, please feel free to call um, to contact the K-12 COVID-19 testing mailbox and we can get you um, directly set up. Um, Jeremiah, if you're on the line, um, there are some questions about the CLIA. So if you could just reiterate again, do schools need to fill out the CLIA for this year and what should schools do if they filled out a CLIA last year? Yeah, great. Thanks, Lauren. Um, every school that's going to be doing any Binax Now testing, so that's you know 98 or so percent of schools, um, should have filled out the CLIA form that's online. It just takes a couple of minutes um, at the school level. So just to be clear, at a district with say 10 schools, you have to fill it out 10 times for each address, and I understand that that's uh, frustrating. Um, and if you did it in the spring, you don't have to do it again. 
but if you tested in nine schools in the spring and now you're adding the 10th school to your testing program now in the fall, then you should go back and just fill it out for that 10th school. Um, and I know I saw a question earlier today, um, although Lauren, I think you answered it for the person who asked, but just so everybody's aware, um, you will get to the kind of landing page once you submit that survey that says, thank you for your submission, but there's no other kind of you know, letter of receipt or email of receipt that you're gonna get after you complete that survey. If you submit it, um, then you are counted. And just to reiterate too, um, the CIC team will be notifying each district um, prior to them sending the Binex Now kits out if your school has not been has not filled out the CLIA properly. And so we will make sure that your schools are have the right information on the CLIA form um, before you begin testing. Um, Russell, if you could um, go back to when testing during the test and stay program should happen on the weekends and what tests should be used. Sure, and this actually responds to a question that I saw in my chat as well. Uh, so let's just start with the basics. Test and stay, um, it, we're looking at a seven day period, but it always includes the weekends. So we're asking you to do five days of, it, really what it would take is five days of testing in the school because at least two days, Two day, for two days of that, the students won't be in school. So it's a seven day period, but you're doing five days worth of testing. So let's just imagine it starts on Monday through Friday. We would ask that you go ahead and um, extend that to the next Monday and test the students upon return to school. So uh, day seven would technically be Sunday, uh, but when the students return to school on day eight, the next Monday, uh, we would ask that you go ahead and test the students again, uh, just to, you know, confirm that nothing came up over the weekend essentially um, however there are some situations so by and large students won't be tested over the weekend it'll be very we think rare because you know elementary students for example don't have the kind of as many of the school sponsored activities as high school students do so it might be more likely for high school students than for elementary school students for example so let's just imagine you know high school activity is happening and after uh, an extracurricular activity is happening on a Saturday um, and the student is involved in test and stay. That's where we would ask that you use um, EMED uh, or if you can by next now, depending on you know what's available to have that individual um, conduct the test on the weekend and then uh, know that they can participate in that extracurricular activity. Um, Lauren, Jeremiah, I just want to see if there's anything else that we should add about the number of days and then what happens for students participating in school sponsored activities, how we can know that they have the green light to continue to participate. No, I think you got it right. Um, I would just say that the um, really the only time a student should be using the EMED is when they need to participate in one of the um, extracurricular or sports activities, school sponsored sports activities over the weekend. But any other time that an individual needs to participate in tests and stay during the school day, they should be using the Bionix Now tests um, in school and getting tested in the morning um, each school day. Um, we did get a question about um, if a symptomatic individual should be in test and stay. And the answer to that is no, all symptomatic um, individuals um, really should be um, tested immediately that they present symptoms and then depending on which symptoms they have, um, likely sent home to quarantine. But again, those nuances are in our protocols documents um, on our symptoms list and so should be looked at per individual based on their vaccination status um, and uh, based on the symptoms that they're presenting. Jeremiah, was there anything else you were going to add? Um, thanks, Lauren. I, the only thing I would say is I know that we've stressed it, as Lauren just did, that these should be only used for, for weekend cases who are in test and stay and you know, have an event over the weekend or an on-school day. Um, but the, like, the one carve-out that I'll put out there is if you have um, close contacts in the building, like if you find out that you have a case right then and you have nothing else to test people on hand, then okay you can like if you literally have nothing else in the building and it's like use these or send kids home um okay but like that's it <laughs> thank you and uh, just a follow-up question on this as well about um who can participate uh i got the question about you know can a student who's at a boys and girls club and is identified as a close contact through an exposure of boys and girls club participate in test and stay the answer is no right because it has to be a school sponsored 
um, after school program. So again, where we know that those same that this you know that your the school is sort of taking some ownership over it's a managed environment, um, and so that risk is um, diminished um, because many of the same strategies are used in the after school program as they were during the day because it's a school sponsored program. Um, so I hope that helps as well. Great. Russell, we're, we're out of time, so we should close. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone. And thanks, Lauren, and thanks, Jeremiah and Rob. Um, we will uh, download your questions as we always do, look to see how we can update our FAQ and uh, keep coming back to you with these webinars as needed as well. Uh, so thanks for your attention today. Thanks for your time. And I wish you all uh, a great start to the school year. Take good care.